It was William Faulkner who famously said, history isn't past, it isn't, history isn't the past, it isn't even past. I quite like that idea of there is no past, there is no present. Everything is enfolded. And objects in particular have this really magical way of always staying the same, only people change. So objects are always the same, people change. So things keep changing as you look at them. I'm just gonna go through a few little things that have come up through the conference that I just thought I'll get out of the way so you know a little bit about me because it's much better for me to tell you about myself rather than Google it. Um, somebody's, one of the things that keeps coming up is this idea about how painting can be relevant today. Now, if there's a couple of things and you won't, you'll see as we look through the talk, I'm very interested in gardening. I think gardening is the great sort of metaphor for curating. And if you want to learn about curating is go to the Botanic Gardens, which is just up the hill, and look at the way things are put together. It's actually quite, they're physical objects that you look at the texture, you look at the color, and they're actually quite formally engaging sort of spaces. But I'm quite keen on the English gardening writer and gardener, a guy called Christopher Lloyd, who I think is just a beautiful, beautiful writer. And if you want to see what good writing is, read Christopher Lloyd. It is about gardening, but if you forget about the gardening, it's beautiful writing. And this question about how painting can be relevant today reminds me of something that he said, because he's got an, he, well, he's passed away, but he had an open garden called Great Dixter, which is in Sussex. It's about an hour out of London. And people would constantly come up to him and say, when does the garden look its best? And he'd always say, the garden looks its best today, which I think is a great answer. So when people say, when will painting be at its best? It's at its best right now. The other thing I want to talk about too is it seems sort of odd to me, well, it's not really odd, I think it's great, that we've got a group of speakers and the people who are sort of working in those secondary roles. I always think of artists as being primary producers, curators and writers being secondary producers. The people in those secondary roles have had some sort of relationship with painting, not just about looking, but about making, which I think is really interesting. I went to art school and I studied to be a painter. I didn't study art history. I studied that art of making things. I don't think I was ever a great artist and I gave it away very quickly and I burnt all of my paintings at a barbecue once in a ceremonial burning, but there's, so there's none of it out there. But it gave you an idea about things and about materials. It's actually really different from a curator who might have studied curating. I think it's actually an age thing. I think, there's, I think I'm of the last generation where curators might have gone to art school. I think now curators study to be curators. They're interested in curating. They're not interested in art. And they're two completely different things. Not that I'm saying I'm not interested in curating. Sort of not, really. I'm like an anti-curator, but I think that's quite an important distinction. And I think the other thing that happens, and I think Gavin sort of touched on it there, you can't be an important artist in Australia now unless you live in Berlin. So I think it's really funny that there's a painting show on in Berlin, because when I go back, a whole lot of younger curators will start saying, you know, painting's really important, there's a big survey on in Berlin. And I'll have to say, I always knew it was important. I was just in Oslo talking about it. <laughs> the other thing I think we need, that, that will come out in the talk too, because one of the artists I'm sort of focusing on knew this in his bones, I think, from the very beginning, is this idea that conceptualism and painting are somehow separate, they're not. Great painting is always conceptual. It always has ideas behind it, and they're always linked. Then I'm just going to tell you something about myself. I believe at looking at things. I believe in good and bad. I believe in loving things. I want to be dumbstruck. Great paintings can make you sick. I have a weird response. When I see really great art, I actually feel physically ill. So it's not just great painting, but great art can make me sick. I've wept in front of three artworks. The tally is two paintings, one video. So paintings win. <laughs> My talk ends on quite a cynical note, but I just wanted to sort of tell you something this morning. I went up to the Botanical Gardens and I walked around and sadly the greenhouses were shut. But I looked through the window and 
that's how I do get a bit emotional sometimes. I looked through the window and I saw through there a Banksia serrata and an acacia, which are Australian natives, in this greenhouse in Oslo. I was desperate to break them out. I shook on the door, I couldn't get in. You're not allowed in the greenhouses until 11. And it reminded me of something that a great Australian painter, Guy Warren, had told me, who was an expatriate painter in London in the 1950s with another great painter, Fred Williams, and they used to go to Kew Botanic Gardens with scissors and steal eucalyptus leaves, take them back to their house and burn them because it reminded them of Australia. Australian art, maybe more than a lot of other art forms being made around the world, is intrinsically about place. If it's not about place, it's really lacking something. And I think that'll sort of start to come out in the talk, which does sort of meander, which I said to someone this morning. Sometimes the talk could be a series of anecdotes strung together and it may not make sense, but I hope that it does. And it starts, weirdly enough, on the Mississippi in 1927. One of the other things I'm really interested in, apart from gardening and sometimes curating, is music, and blues music in particular, and how blues music sort of transmits across all of these different cultures. In 1927, the Mississippi flooded, which led to the diaspora of African Americans moving from the South up to Chicago, which you might think, what did that have to do with music? But it actually turned an acoustic form of blues music into an electric form. When it went to Chicago, blues musicians performing in nightclubs and bars, they had to electrify their music, uh, their instruments, and electric guitars became readily available. So it actually sort of led, funnily enough, to the English blues explosion. But this is a photo of Memphis Minnie, who wrote and sang a fantastic song in the 1930s called When the Levee Breaks, which you can hear it. It's a widely available song, but a really amazing song about the breaking of the levee and about moving to Chicago. So it has this incredible sort of political potency about people moving and about this sort of diaspora of culture sort of moving through America, but then it sort of starts to disseminate outwards. This is another example of when I said to one of the curatorial assistants, she said, how's your talk going? And I said, much better now that Led Zeppelin's in it. And she said, you're not doing that, are you? <laughs> they are in Sydney, though. Led Zeppelin famously recorded their own version of When the Levee Breaks. They reinvigorated that music, and they say Jimmy Page, who's on the right, along with Eric Clapton and Keith Richards and Jeff Beck, came from the Thames Delta, that they were all listening to this blues music that had been sort of transported from America had come to them and they started to reorganize it and reshape it. And then they actually introduced those blues musicians back to America. A lot of those people like Muddy Waters, even early rock and rollers like Chuck Berry and Little Richard were actually sort of came in the trail of those English performers who loved that music so much. This is also in 1972 and it's an artist who's sort of central to my thinking of the last 40 years in Australian art it's an artist called Tim Johnson. And at this period, he was part of a collective of artists called the Inhibitress Arc uh, Gallery. And it was himself, Mike Parr, and Peter Kennedy. And yesterday was brought up this idea about painting being, maybe painting could be composed of light. And Tim was a pioneer of working with light in Australian art. This is a series of performances he did where he swung lights in the space, he smashed lights, he did a terrific work where he got in a train and in between two train stations he smashed all the lights in the trains until it went dark. So he was playing with light and dark. And Tim was working through conceptualism. He'd started out as a painter and then he started to think about painting. So in the mid-70s he actually started painting. This is like a preface to the talk. Just so you got an idea about distance, we might think, well, yeah, it is a long way from Australia to here, but if I was in Sydney, which is here, it's not the greatest image of Australia. Papunya Tula is a settlement right in the middle of Australia, 
which is about as remote as you could get in terms of actually getting there. You'd have to either drive there or fly a plane into Alice Springs and then fly another plane there. It's incredibly remote, dispersed community. And to non-Indigenous eyes, I think it would look like there was nothing there, but it's actually full, it's abundant. But if you looked at it, if I looked at it through my eyes, or if you went there as a European person and you looked, you would think there's nothing here, but it's actually full. It's full of stories, it's full of mythology, it's full of plants, it's full of food, it's full of light, it's full of air. There was another flood that happened in 1972, and that was to do with paintings that were produced at Papunya in this incredibly remote community in the middle of nowhere. This is a work by Johnny Warangula Japarula, and it's called Dreaming at Kala Pinyapa, 1972. And it's part of the first flush of paintings that were produced at Papunya. Now this story about how these paintings were made is quite well known, and we'll get to it, but just, there's been a couple of questions about Australian paintings sort of coming back and forth and about how you read them. Personally, I think you need to read them formally and aesthetically to begin with. They are full of meaning, but the meaning, you could maybe put it aside to begin with and think about how they look. These paintings are really small. To actually project it up on this screen is really deceptive. It's only about that big. And if you actually go to the Royal Academy show, there's one of these Johnny Warangula Japarula water paintings is actually on show at the moment at the Royal Academy in London, so you can see it. But they shimmer and they have this sort of fetish-like power. They're painted on really rough bits of board. They're not painted on mainstream art supplies. Some are, on, some are painted on bits of fibro, bits of masonite, old scraps of canvas that were lying on the floor, lino that's been chipped off from an old building and painted on the reverse. So there's this desperate need to sort of get these paintings out. The thing about the flood though, is that in 1972, in Papunya, which is very dry sort of region, there was unseasonably wet conditions and the landscape actually flooded. So Johnny Warangula Japarula, who owned a lot of these water stories, when it came his time to paint, he just started to paint actually sort of what was outside. To me, this is not just a painting of the flood, but it's also a painting of a garden. It's about all of the things that come alive once the, once the ground and the landscape is inundated with water. All of this new activity starts to happen. He famously also, at this point, is starting to invent this dotting style Often those dots are meant to hide things. They're meant, these are sacred objects as well as being paintings. They were made to be sold. They were made for the market. But there's stories within them that certain people aren't allowed to know about. Not just European people, but even people within that community weren't allowed to know and only certain people could talk about certain aspects. So to hide those stories and to hide those symbols, they invented this dotting technique to actually screen off parts of the painting. But it started to become a sort of means unto itself as time progressed. This is another thing, I don't want to sort of get stuck with this, but I think it's important to know that Geoffrey Barden, who's on the right, and here he is with old Tom Onion, they're at Papunya, it's 1972, Geoffrey was a school teacher who went to Papunya and he realised the sort of cultural significance of the senior men that were there in the community and he encouraged them to paint. So that's where these paintings come from, from Geoffrey's encouragement. Geoffrey was literally sort of run out of the community after about two years or so, but he actually kick-started this whole Indigenous Australian painting movement starts at this moment. You could almost say this is the moment it starts. It starts with a very specific group of people and it starts with one specific person who actually brings it above ground. It's the forms that a lot of these artists are using are made for sacred objects and they're used for sand painting, but he almost says let's do it in a permanent way 
And then what he used to do was batch up the paintings and ship them to Alice Springs. Now, Alice Springs is a tiny place. It's a tiny, tiny place. And he'd sell them at an art, an art shop for $50, $100, never very much money. But it was a way to get money back into the community for these men so they could stay there and they could just live so that they could stay on their community. This is an incredible image that was only found about five or six years ago and it shows some of the painters in what they called the Great Painting Shed at Papunya. And the man in the center, that's Johnny Warangula Japarula with one of his water dreamings. And you can see the amount of work that was made in this flurry, in this initial two years that Geoffrey Barden is there. Now of all those paintings, they can only account for about half of them, but they were all documented before they went out, but they've all sort of gone missing. It's quite mysterious. And I think people coming to Alice Springs would buy them. Now I've jumped back to music and I'm gonna read you something that Tim Johnson sent to me. In 1980, I had a dream where an Aboriginal man met me at a bridge and took me across a river and into a new pristine land. The next morning, I booked a ticket to Alice Springs thinking this was a sign telling me to go to Papunya. When I got there, I went to the Papunya Tula office, which was next to a vacant lot. There were a few older Aboriginal men waiting around and they talked to me. They turned out to be Tim Lura, who I thought was the person in the dream, Johnny Warangula and Billy Stockman. They took my visit pretty seriously and asked me to help them, explaining that they'd been painting for some years but with little success. Then Andrew Crocker, who was the arts advisor at Papunya, invited me to come back again and go to Papunya, which I did with Vivian a few months later. The connection to the blues was that as a teenager, I'd collected blues records and was aware of how blues artists were being rediscovered. I planned to go to Central Australia when I left school to record Aboriginal music, but didn't get around to it. But I used to imagine that there might be something undiscovered in Central Australia, like the blues were in America until the 60s, and I wanted to go and look for it. After meeting the artists, I felt endeared to them in the same way that I'd admired and felt close to the blues singers. The connection I used to think about was the blues had given birth to a baby, rock and roll, so perhaps Papunya paintings would do the same thing in the art world. It was, an idea that some, it's an, it was the idea that something with a specific cultural identity of its own might actually evolve into something universal. So there's Tim when he heads to Papunya in 1980 with one of the artists. And there's a group of artists. These works are actually in the archive of the MCA and the artists are unidentified at this point. And then this is a painting that Tim did in 1987 where he quite obviously uses the dotting technique. And I think what I'm trying to sort of bring out is the fact that in Australia, to understand painting today, you have to understand this relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. It's not the only dialogue that's going on. I think there's other stories that are just as important about post-World War II migration and the effect that that has had on the Australian cultural scene. But this is almost at the core of Australian art, is this relationship between black and white. And Tim always said he never appropriated, he only collaborated. So in the 1980s in Australia, and here's another image, there's this movement towards appropriation, which has something to do with distance. And here you'll see this is one of Tim's actual photos that he's turned into a painting. And then Tim really started to mix it up and mix all sorts of motifs into the painting. So this is called Little Bighorn, which incorporates a sort of kitsch American Indian iconography starting to get mixed up with Buddhism and Aboriginal art. But Tim sort of felt this, you know, this idea that Tim had a vision that drove him to Papunya is quite compelling. Of all the artists I know, he's the one who would actually listen to a vision like that. Whereas this artist is Imance Tiller, who I think is much more methodical about that sort of relationship between black and white. Imance came out of conceptualism as well and started to appropriate images from magazines. And there's a great example yesterday where Adrian was talking about how he was stoned and Cezanne finally clicked and then he went to the courthold. 
if you live in Australia, you'd have to spend a day traveling in a plane to go to the courthold. You can't go to the courthold. So everything is coming through magazines, all of this information. People like to think that even now it's changed because of the internet, but it's basically the same. The internet is the same. So all of these images would come and Imantz would sort of grid them up and then he'd combine all of these images together to make a new image. And this is made up out of a series of canvas boards, which he's numbered. So here he's at 928. So it's quite early in this canvas board period that Imantz is still doing. And he thinks of it as a big book. He's actually you could put all the canvas boards together and make a big giant book. And this idea of white Aborigines to me is a telling sort of difference between, say, what Tim Johnson was doing and what I think artists are doing now. I think this is very much a sort of cynical, postmodern approach towards Aboriginal art. I think a lot of the artists in this period in the 1980s in Australia, non Indigenous artists, were very much thinking about international careers, about taking their artwork out of Australia, taking it to Europe, taking it to Venice, taking it to America, taking it to London, those sort of power centres that still exist. They were thinking about taking it there, whereas what was fast emerging as the most dominant art form in Australia was Aboriginal art that had, a lot of the time, artists who had no concept of the art market, who didn't care about the art market, who didn't care about the art world, all of their relationships with their painting and the paintings they were making were quite often internal or about their sort of immediate family or community. And Tillers plays around with this idea, idea of the white Aborigine, that they're a sort of different version of the Aboriginal, this sort of nomad, a global nomad, rather than the sort of Australian nomad. And it's proposed by a writer called Paul Taylor. It's actually his idea, this white Aborigines. But then Tillers started to get into a bit of trouble, I think, with the emergence of a much more volatile, urban Aboriginal politic and painting in particular. And this is a work called The Nine Shots. And it's taking an image, it's a basilisk painting, which has been overlaid with these sacred symbols from a Michael Nelson Jagamara painting, who was an indigenous man living at Papunya. And Imarts had sort of seen these two images, two images in a magazine and just sort of shut, folded them across one another. This painting became really controversial because it was reproduced in the Biennale of Sydney catalogue of 1986. And because of this certain um, twist of fate, Tillers came before Jagamara Nelson. So when Michael Nelson actually got the book, he didn't realise that Amance had done this, that Amance had taken his story and taken his symbols. And I think he was quite okay with it when he realised that it had happened. But a whole lot of painters and political sort of agitators started to sort of push at Imants and push at this sort of blind appropriation and say, you just can't do this, you just can't take symbols from Aboriginal art, which we see as sacred, and incorporate them into a non-sacred form. And perhaps the artist who started to critique Imants most of all by basically appropriating Imants Tillers back and giving it back to him was Gordon Bennett, who was an indigenous man who lives and works in Brisbane. So another sort of regional centre, it's not Sydney or Melbourne, are the main cities in Australia. He's from Brisbane and he makes this painting, The Nine Ricochets, Fall Down Black Fella, Jump Up White Fella, where he actually appropriates Imants, but then he gives us an image of dispossession of Australia. And here the colonisers sort of taking Australia by force. It's only been in recent years really that Australia started to recognise its troubled history, that its history is one sort of steeped in blood and war and dispossession. And now we have a new conservative government, you almost feel like things are going to turn back again. There's this idea of the previous conservative government called it the black armband view of history. And they, were, they, they engaged in this sort of culture war where all of these stories were sort of looked upon as being politically correct and sort of pushed out of the museum. And I have to say, as a museum, 
The MCA, we were actually lacking work by Gordon Bennett, and I'm lucky in that I can do this slideshow and show you works from the collection. This is a work by Gordon that's from 1999, so it's come on a bit. It's nine years, nine years later. Home decor, relative absolute flowers for Mathena. And I think where Gordon started out as this sort of very deliberate critiquing of Imant's Tillers, he sort of pushed it and pushed it into his own directions. And this work also takes on the troubled history of Australia. This is an image of Mathena, who was a young girl who grew up in Tasmania in the 1800s. So Tasmania is a state of Australia, and it was one of the, it's one of the oldest colonised parts of Australia. And there was an engraver from England who was sent to Australia as a convict called Thomas Bock, who set up a watercolour portrait school and he, he actually did this portrait, which Gordon has appropriated, of a girl that the governor of Tasmania kidnapped, basically, from her family so that their daughter would have someone to play with. And that was Mathena. And then after a year, they left and they went back to England and they just left her behind like a discarded toy. They'd sort of break, broken her apart from her community and then left her just behind and within 10 years she'd passed away sadly on the streets of Tasmania and Tasmania is one of the places where the war between black and white Australia really took place. It's quite a divisive history and there's an idea that all of the Tasmanians were wiped out in Tasmania. All of the Aboriginal Tasmanians were wiped out but they actually weren't. They were still a thriving community but Gordon sort of takes on that history and the other image, which is a bit hard to see here, but it's this image here, is actually the Franklins who did these terrible things, they actually built the first art gallery in Australia, and it's in Tasmania, it's in the suburbs, and that's an image of the art gallery. But over that, he's overlaid all of these different sort of quotations from all types of different artists, but the one that could be unfamiliar and might need explaining is this piece here is by an Australian painter and printer called Margaret Preston, who believed she was working between the two world wars, and she believed that an, a unique Australian visual art could be built by fusing Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal together. So she's almost a sort of, she almost preempts what's to come later, and with hindsight, people look at it and think, you know, that's deeply problematic, but I feel she sort of primed the ground for the sort of painting movements that happened in the 70s and then what's happening in the present. And I feel, and this is my reading completely, is this is almost like a gift being exchanged back to Mathena through the painting. Now I'm sort of jumping around and I've broken this up, the talk, sort of decade by decade, loosely decade by decade, but sort of pairing people together. So this is a work by Emily Kame Kanware and it's called Awaili, and that's the name of ceremony, a particular type of ceremony that she might be engaged with, which is about, part of that ceremony is body painting. So this painting actually derives from the marks that would have been made on a body for a performance. And that's actually Emily there painted up for, for performance. And she only started painting when she was in her 70s and moved through this really rapid progression of art styles and she painted for about 10 years all up but started in a style that's called dump dump and ended up at this style which is much more linear and fits within a western idea of abstraction i think that's why she is um being able to come into the museum quite easily and that people can look at it and understand it the thing that quite often gets asked about this is, well, what does she know about abstraction? And anyone who's seen the Royal Academy show, they have one of her masterpieces in the entry. I, it's not a word you should use, but I'll use it, um, called Big Yam Painting, which you'll see when you come in, which is one of the great paint Australian paintings. But that was just the drive to make it. And it relates back to her country and it relates back to ceremony, but it also sort of fits quite easily into ideas of abstraction, and that painting in particular, 
people say, oh, you know, she must have been looking at someone like Bryce Martin, but she wouldn't even have had a concept of who Bryce Martin was, and she wouldn't have cared. <laughs> then this is a work by Dorothy Nappengardi, and the thing that's happened too in the past 20 years or so is the slides I showed you at the beginning of Johnny Warangula Japarula, it was all men making those paintings, that first flush of paintings. Now, wet now it tends to be women in these remote areas who are making this work. So she lives in a place called the Minamina, which is a, near a salt lake, and quite often she does these paintings which describe her country. It's almost like a linear topographical map but made up out of dots, tiny, tiny dots like pearls on the painting surface. Women, I think, are starting to inherit a lot of the stories or starting to sort of come forward as the first generation of Aboriginal artists have actually passed away. That it's women who are sort of coming in, standing in the place now and making the best work, I think. But I just wanted to show you this artist, which is Ildiko Kovacs, who's an artist, a sort of mid-career, I think would be the term you'd use, artist living in Sydney, who is non-Indigenous, but has spent a lot of time looking and working with Indigenous people. So abstractions become this contested sort of zone where there was a statement yesterday about, was it Yo-Yo Ma, about the, the boulder in the road. Aboriginal art for non-Aboriginal painters has become the boulder in the road, that they have to work out a way to get around it or through it, but they have to deal with it somehow, that it's become sort of deeply ingrained within the Australian art world. And the next artist that I'll show you, the next non-Indigenous artist I'll show you, I think his work could be about that very thing. And Ildiko has actually gone out and worked with Aboriginal people and started to sort of have this exchange relationship where the artists that she's working with are quite often incorporating motifs from her work and vice versa. It's moving back and forth both ways. Now, this is Nyapa Nyapa, and quite a pivotal artist. She comes from Yurikala, which is in Arnhem Land. And these are bark paintings. And bark paintings before the Papunya Tula movement were the sort of art, Aboriginal art form that everybody knew about. But she lives in a community which is, has an incredible sort of spiritual life. And a lot of the painting, most of the painting that has been made up until now has been about sacred sites or ceremonies stories that are handed down sort of through families that are then sort of turned into representations on bark paintings. But she's one of the first to actually just start painting everyday events. And this is about, she was gored by a bull when she was a child and she was taken from Yurikala to Darwin for medical treatment. And this is about actually going on the plane and going to Darwin. It's quite a radical thing to see. It's not the sort of thing you usually see in bark paintings. And Yurikala, where she lives and works, is probably the art center that's really encouraging this type of innovation. And then this is about actually coming to Sydney for an exhibition, an exhibition of the painting before. And here, that's her driving around Sydney in a car. And then below, that's the Harbour Bridge. So it's not the type of thing that you, is usually done. Now, that's radical, whereas this is incredibly radical. She started to make, almost all of a sudden, these white paintings. And there's a word that she uses, which is male mirawa, which means nothing. These paintings are about nothing, they're just about painting. And sometimes she's getting bigger. So she moves around. And I mean, some are this big and some are quite big. I think this one's about this big. The bark is cut from the tree. It's flattened out with smoke and flame. So it's flat and then it's primed and then it's painted on. But as soon as it's finished, 
it'll keep moving, keeps moving all the time. The, the humidity in the air will manipulate, the bark will just be going like this. And so it's constantly changing, but it's this amazing rough surface. So where you see a patch like this, that patch is actually following some slight undulation in the bark painting. It's like looking at static or something. That is incredible sort of innovation in bark painting. It may not look like much, but it's a radical change from what has happened in the past. And I think what this leads to is this is a young artist, Sydney artist, called Tom Polo. I talked to Tom before I left about how he felt about Aboriginal art. And I think there's some things you can say and you can't say, but one of the things that I think has happened with Aboriginal art is it's put a lot of doubt into non-Indigenous painters in Australia. Non-Aboriginal artists, they look at what's happening with Aboriginal art, which seems so natural, and people's careers take off like skyrockets. You know, Nyapa Nyapa, she's an old lady, but her career is, within five years, she's now sort of representing Australia overseas, whereas a young non-Indigenous painter, nothing may happen forever, you know, and they look at what happened, and I think it breeds doubt within them, and they have to work out a way to deal with it, which is not a formal thing, it's actually about, I don't think you, and I'm not, this is not about Tom specifically, but I think you would look at what's happening and you think, well, what's gonna happen to me and my career? And as a painter, should I keep going? Because these artists are so great, I don't know whether I can be any good. And I think a lot of Tom's work is about doubt and about the doubt of painting and what it is to be a painter now anyway. I think that's why he does things like he does this wall painting and then he does these paintings on sticks in a way of sort of invigorating them or maybe, maybe making them more than just things on a wall. Like I have to take it off the wall. I have to make it something else for it to be valid as contemporary art, whatever contemporary art might be. And I think that sort of drives his work and it is what makes it interesting. But just as a point of comparison, this is Sally Gabori who's just, I never sort of realized that, but that Sally Gabori who's an artist who's in her 70s and only started painting about five or six years ago and has this incredible sort of facility and is being purchased by big museums and makes this incredibly beautiful, vibrant work. I think that must sort of sow some sort of deep seed in a young artist's mind about, okay, well, what am I gonna do? Like, how do I approach this? And I just sort of threw these in because I am very proud of our museum and our history with Aboriginal art. And we've been very steadfast in not separating Aboriginal art from non-Aboriginal art. We show both together. We don't have Aboriginal galleries. We don't have non-Aboriginal galleries. We mix it all up and we treat it as art first. That's the first thing. And then you deal with all the other things after. And that can be something like this is an incredibly formal sort of image by Robert Owen, which is the wall painting on the right. But on the left, you'll see a series of bark paintings. These things sort of coexisting at the same time. This is what I mean about the past. And I'm just gonna finish with a couple of things which sort of go back to the beginning to just show you where some of the artists I've spoken about, about are at now. This is Imant's Tiller, it's a work from 2011. And you'll see how many canvas boards he's up to now. And this is a work about his father. And his father worked in the Australian outback as an engineer and it's the name of a whole lot of places in Australia sort of cascading down the canvas. Often they're Aboriginal words. And then these are new works by Gordon Bennett. Works that we've just purchased for the MCA collection where he's appropriating from Basqua and that image that's overlaid is Julia Gillard the ex-female Prime Minister of Australia, so she's the city dweller. And here, that's Peter Garrett, who some of you might know, to go back to music, was the lead singer of a band called Midnight Oil, but was then became sort of sole, he was a member of the Nuclear Disarmament Party, then solely sole, went to the Labor Party, became a sitting member, and I think he re resigned in the last election. 
This is a work of Tim. So Tim has gone back to his sort of 70s and 80s works. But here now you can see he's starting to bring in things like UFOs as well. And he's just done a series of um, Spitfires and bombers that his father flew bombers in World War II. So he's doing these ghost bombers. And this is sadly sort of where we're going to end on a sort of cynical note. I think the market is the thing I haven't spoken about very much. And I just wanted to show you that on the left there is an auction at Sotheby's where they're selling the water dreaming painting that I showed you at the beginning. And it was a painting that changed hands, I think originally for about $100. And it sold for 486,000 to a New York collector. Johnny didn't get any of that money. And Johnny ended up dying destitute in Alice Springs in a home for old men. But now what's happened, and it's where I'm gonna leave you, is that they've brought in resale royalties for Australian artists, which has caused another huge set of problems. But I think that's, I'm ending cynically, but thank you. <laughs>